Okay, so while that's loading, um, since we probably can't figure out the internet stuff, some, maybe some of the, um, the clips won't um, come up as well. Um, so we'll just go off the, re the rest of what we have here. So pretend that was like a movie clip uh, and the old film screen with the countdowns and the 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 thing going on. Um, can everyone see that okay? My four, five, six member audience? Okay. So burial ground protection 101 intersects with law, construct of race, and the protection of human remains. Um, I put on there the construct of race because if any of you have peace and justice, you know about the construct of race being versus being uh, an actual element. Uh, more like a societal construct of race, so I thought that's important to differentiate. Um, this is me. My name's Jules Jackson. I'm an indigenous rights activist. Raise your hand if you know any. No? Okay. Well, you do now, so next time someone asks you that question, you can raise your hand. Um, I recently founded a nonprofit, Indigenous Power, to uh, consolidate all my activism uh, under one roof. Uh, kind of like an umbrella organization similar to what you have here with MSL. They kind of put everything together. I took that idea and put all my activism um, together into a uh, 501c3 um, called Indigenous Power. So I do everything from curriculum reform and education uh, to this, to burial ground protection, which is kind of like my forte, my expertise. Um, the picture that you see right here um, is actually a park bench that gives you an idea of where I'm from. It's a place um, I live at the beach, which is Rehoboth Beach, but this is just outside the limits, Georgetown, Delaware. So pretty much what we have going on in Georgetown, Delaware, as far as Native Americans go, is a park bench. So I don't know if I should be excited that at least we have one thing. Um, and then it's for Pocahontas, which is not even our people or anywhere near around us. Um, so right next to it is a, a stockade where they used to have people out in the circle with their head and their arms through. Um, they were. I guess, courteous enough to decorate it um, with some ribbon for breast cancer awareness, which is good. But if that gives you an idea of the mentality uh, that we're talking about here, it is uh, very Southern. Um, we'll, we'll say Southern and, and utilize that as a politically correct term. Um, the insert I had here, but we can't get on the internet, um, is if you're familiar with Stephen Colbert. Uh, Wynonna LaDuke was on his uh, show fairly recently. Wynonna LaDuke was Ralph Nader's vice presidential candidate running mate. Um, she was on the show uh, talking about um, issues that she works on. She also works on barrier on protection. Her forte works on the White Earth Land Recovery Project. Um, it was a really cute uh, tidbit there. If you want to write that down or get it from me later, um, or just Google Why Don't LaDuke and uh, Stephen Colbert is really funny. It started off with mascots, every mascot imaginable. Stephen Colbert joked, you know, what more could Native Americans want? You're already kind of taking over the world because you have these mascots kind of thing. If you're familiar with the show, you're familiar with um, his sarcasm. So getting into the heart of what I'm talking about today. Um, unmarked human remains laws, and we're going to stay in the realm of American law versus... Uh, Native American law or any issues dealing with sovereignty. They, talk, they spoke about that in the video um, that I had up here before with Stephen Colbert. And uh, it questioned uh, former President uh, George Bush to expand upon the topic of Native Americans and sovereignty and what does that mean. And it was something along, along the lines of it means they're sovereign and Native Americans and it means they're so and sovereign. And that was his answer. Um, so not a lot of people understand it, obviously, including the former president of the United States. So we'll just go ahead and stick with American law. And I'm going to um, 
dilute that even more and stick with the state of Delaware, which is where I'm from, just one state south. So in the state of Delaware, you have um, laws that are protecting animals, and then you have laws that are protecting uh, unmarked human remains. Obviously, uh, the laws uh, protecting the animals far outweigh by a ratio of approximately seven to one uh, the laws protecting the unmarked human remains. Uh, these are the specific names of the laws that you have on the right-hand side. Um, unmarked human remains are uh, on your left. Um, so Delaware has some fairly decent, decent laws, and we'll get into that later. Um, okay, so they have decent laws, but what happens when they're not enforced? Um, do laws really matter if there's not that additional element of enforcement? D. Did you see my dad out there? Yeah, can you, yeah. Um, this is my roommate from college, Daniel Jewell. Uh, so Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs, every state has one. Um, where are you from? Um, New York. New York, okay. Where are you from? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, right here. And sir? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. And my friend in the back? Massachusetts. Massachusetts and Miss Anthony. You're from? Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Okay, so two Massachusetts. Okay, so when you go home to your individual state, all you have to do is Google your individual state and Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs, and bam, right there, you should receive your own state's version of information pertaining to their procedures and protocol protecting unmarked human remains, uh, dealing with something called repatriation. Say we stumble upon some unmarked human remains. What do we do? Where do they go? Um, Delaware, however, doesn't really have that going on. Um, my two best friend's names, cut and paste, in terms of Microsoft Word, they don't get that concept of cut and paste. They can just go places and cut and paste, um, cite the appropriate sources, and they're done. Bada bing, bada boom, and they have some information on there. Um, all they have on there right now, currently, with cemeteries and burial grounds, it says that it's last updated February 2nd, 2007, when I recently testified in front of county council about that they said, oh, well, that's fairly recent. So we're operating under two distinctly different paradigms here with what is fairly recent. The only reason, however, they have 2nd February 2007 as updated to their procedures is because I nag them every day, pretty much every hour on the hour, until they put a blurb up there which said, uh, something along the lines of this process is being continually updated. So what does that mean? Um, so basically you're out of the site, you stumble upon unmarked human remains, it says call this telephone number. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not an archaeologist, so I don't know what I'm stumbling upon. Is it bone? Is it rock? We don't know. There's no pictures, there's no protocol. So that's what I, one of my objectives as an indigenous rights activist specializing in burial ground protection is specifically to get these procedures and protocol in place so when someone, someone stumbles, pardon me, upon those remains, the appropriate action can occur. I'm sorry. Uh, Delaware Department of Transportation. Um, when I have these signs that are last updated in Delaware and probably in Massachusetts, probably in Pennsylvania, they have the same exact um, way of updating their system. On the lower right hand side of the screen, you can tell every time that they have updated um, their web page. So coincidentally, Dell Dot had not updated their web page since the early 2000s, pretty much when internet was just getting hopping. Um, so I see them at an uh, informational meeting and I mention, hey, Dell Dot, Delaware Department of Transportation, you don't really have anything about unmarked human remains. So when you're digging in a road, what do people do? How do they refer to it? You don't have any information on your website. I said, oh, we've had it up for years and blah, blah, blah. And you know, but since I've been doing this pretty much every day for three years, I have to disagree with them. So I go back to their website the very next day, which would be Friday, February 29, 2008. Coincidentally, what happens? They have an updated uh, version of their website. Now, it's still with the same old everything, but because I made that mention of it, they went ahead and uh, went on their website, okay? So this is how the process has kind of uh, evolved where I live. There are only three counties in Delaware. How many in Massachusetts? Do you even, any idea? Wow. More than three, okay. So there's only three counties in Delaware. It's not that hard to do a lot of the things that we're um, talking about. Um, so when we talked about just having the unmarked human remains and they're not reported, um, we have no unmarked human remains, therefore, for the unmarked human remains committee, which was in that previous law that I showed up on the screen a couple screens ago, um, for the unmarked human remains committee to review. So the unmarked human remains committee to review remains, they have to be reported. How are they going to be reported when we don't have the information that's disseminated to tell us how to report? So ergo, the logic kind of dictates, well, wait a minute. 
if there's something wrong in the beginning process, this entire cyclical process, therefore, has a rut in it from the very beginning. So we uh, don't report the remains. They don't go to the Human Remains Committee as dictated by law. Um, and then on top of that, what is dictated by law, local, state, there's no oversight. So those uh, organizations that I mentioned that have not updated, uh, Del Dot and uh, Historical and Cultural Affairs, they have no oversight. So what little bit of information we might have had in the very beginning, by the time it gets to the top, we have nothing. So that was um, the testimony um, I submitted recently, actually last week, to the county council. What they've done is uh, a strategy. Are there any poli-sci majors? No? Okay, um, it doesn't take a poli-sci major to figure out if you have something and you want it on the agenda and you don't want to discuss it, what do you do if you have a meeting that's six hours long? Take a wild guess. Would you maybe put it towards, would it make sense if you put it towards the end of the agenda? So people were leaving, would that make sense? So what they historically have done for the last three years that I've been involved in this is they've put it at the end of the agenda hoping that people will uh, fizzle out. Uh, and fizzling out they do, I'm the one that stays no matter what, and 11.59 uh, was the time that my testimony, testimony pardon me, was recorded. I was in bed at 12.34, uh, up a few hours later to go back to my uh, 9 to 5. All right, so what are the, what are the actual uh, remains and the burial grounds that I'm talking about here? Let's put a picture towards that. The Elmer Human remains are as follows, pardon me. They're located um, in Lewis, Delaware, which happens to be my hometown. So I happened to stumble upon this uh, project while I was working for my dad on the weekends. And my mother, who is not Native American, unlike my dad, said, you know, there's something out there. I don't know what it is. Um, you, know, you know, look into it, Julie. Look into it. And um, I don't think they can build there. So that little comment from my mother three years ago started on this whole entire process by which I determined that where I live in my own backyard is one of the largest indigenous settlements on the entire East Coast. Two of the most famous sites that are known on an international basis, not local, not state, not national, international basis, are what are referred to as the Townsend One and Townsend Two sites, where human remains have actually been excavated. Okay, so 1250 Kings Highway, to give you an idea, that's where I walk to school. My mom lives at 715 Kings Highway. So that's literally how we're talking about um, literally being in my backyard. What I've titled this whole, a whole concept um, in theory is Manifest Destiny 2. Um, probably familiar with Manifest Destiny Roman numeral 1. That was the first type of European invasion. And it's kind of coming around again. Europeans are coming back and saying, OK, we have the land now. Now we're going to do acts that basically will inevitably destroy it, uh, such as all these areas are built on aquifers. And um, I live, as I mentioned, at the beach. All of that water has to go somewhere. Well, when you're putting non-porous surfaces over a porous surface, what's going to happen? It's going to be an issue, OK? Where are the remains that were taken out of the ground from Townsend 1 and Townsend 2 currently located? A little thing I like to call the National Museum of History. Raise your hand if you've ever been there. Anyone? Okay, do you know they have human remains there? No, okay, so we learned something new today. Our you know, six member audience are gonna at least take that away with you, all right? That's where um, my ancestors are located. My father, I'm um, sitting back there, is Nanakoke. Uh, the remains that were taken um, archeologically have been studied by University of Pennsylvania professors such as Carl Westlager, Dr. Westlager in the 1950s, determined to be Nanakoke. So literally we're talking about uh, my ancestors, my cousins, my aunts, my uncles, my grandmother, my grandfather. Uh, another site right down the road, again, because we're talking about several, several square miles, not just miles, square miles. Uh, the Wolf Neck site right down the road. Again, you see that uh, predecessor, or right there, the cursor with the 1250 Kings Highway where I mentioned before. That was the original site. So this entire area is. Uh, filled with uh, the burials, and not just the burials, obviously they're corresponding archaeologically sensitive materials, which we are seeking to protect as well. <clears throat> okay, Blockhouse Pond. So now we're going from one side of the highway over to the other side, which is Savannah Road. In between a couple miles, Blockhouse Pond. Now we're looking right at the middle school. This is like my own personal history lesson for you. Uh, Blockhouse Pond remains were found here as well. So we're talking a couple miles, 
uh, a round trip 10 minute cycle, literally every inch is cover, covered, pardon me, with potential archaeological materials and human remains. I'm wondering if that clock stopped up there. 9.51, we're ready to go. Okay. Um, now we're going to travel a little bit further south, down to the beach. Um, like I mentioned before, my mom lives about a uh, mile and a half, two miles inland maybe. We're going to go all the way down to the beach to an uh, area that is uh, known as Pilot Town, Pilot Town Road. There are two more sites, two more archaeological sites. So we're talking about not just me, not just Jules Jackson, indigenous rights activist, stumbling upon these remains. We're talking about world-renowned archaeologists that have put these sites on the international map, and they all happen to be in my backyard. Um, and basically, they're giving me a job. So we have the old house site as well as the BB site. Tons of shady dealings going on here, OK? We're not going to get into um, the, the minutiae of it. But we have people selling land so they can get away um, under what is called the national, uh, pardon me, the protection, it's NAGPRA. So it's the Protection of the Act for Graves and Repatriation. Graves and Repatriation Act, pardon me, there we go. So um, to deal with NAG, to not deal with NAGPRA, they need to sell the lands before there's any federal money involved. So for instance, when they build a high school, if they take any federal money, the loopholes that everyone will go to are phenomenal to avoid taking federal money because if they do, then they have federal oversight and federal they don't play. They're not like the local and the state who can avoid all of these issues and circumvent these systems and continue to put your name as a last name on the agenda and hope that you go home and go to sleep. Federal has to ha uh, maintain regulatory issues that the local and states do not. So that's a more uh, detailed view. There is a museum called the Zwanendale Museum located in Lewis, Delaware, if you ever uh, go and visit. And this specific map, minus all of these houses, dictates right around where the canal comes in uh, a whaling station. And it shows where the indigenous people met the European invaders right there in that very spot. And it's a map. And it was done in the 1600s. And it's on display at the Zwanendale Museum. Thompson Island. Uh, Thompson Island is another well-known burial site. Ironically, what is interesting about Thompson Island, definitely further to the south, couple couple towns down, and it's obviously an island on the bay side. Thompson Island, people actually got together and decided, hey, what's going on here is wrong. They came together. They protected it. So I utilize it in some of my speeches, some of my lectures, sometimes when I talk to people to say, hey, we can protect this. We have done it in the past. It is protected. And in addition to being protected, it is semi-fairly regularly patrolled by uh, DENREC, um, the Environmental Control. Um, people that go around and they actually make sure that these sites aren't being destroyed. Versus the other sites which we have are all up for development. They've actually approved four, over 400 houses to be built on these sites because the people that uh, voiced their opinions for Thompson Island didn't turn around and come back and voice their opinion for these sites, most likely out of the fact, hey, they just didn't even know that they existed. So it's not necessarily their fault. So that's what I attempt to do in my work as an indigenous rights activist is definitely one of my tenets of my work is to disseminate the information and keep everyone informed. Because there was a point in my life right here when I was in Villanova sitting in, in these seats here at the cinema um, where I didn't know about this information. So that's a more detailed view. OK. So moving away from the technicalities of, of the burial ground site, what, what do I do? What are my options? I spent the last three years researching uh, all of this information so I can be confident when I go to testify in front of local government, in front of state government, in front of the national government, that I know every iota of every technicality, of every number, of every correlation, of every logistic that goes along with protecting these burial grounds. But in the future, what am I going to look towards in terms of action? I thought it was apropos to bring up Dr. King today, obviously, uh, for the Freedom School and explore what he would do, possibly, if he was in my shoes today. And then you have to kind of examine what are the undercurrents of exploring the concept of civil disobedience. Uh, what am I doing right now? I am publicizing an unjust law or cause. Okay, uh, I am attempting to appeal to the conscience of the public. I am attempting to say, hey, you're moral people. You want to protect the people that have died or deceased. If it's your grandmother out there, you would want to protect them. Um, if there are laws 
that have my back in terms of what I'm doing, that one law that we mentioned earlier, I'm attempting to force a negotiation to occur between the landowners, between the county council, between the state of Delaware, between myself, whoever it may be at this collective bargaining table, so to speak, and get them to come to some sort of reasonable agreement where we're not cheating the landowner out of money, but we're also not destroying human remains. Ultimately, um, if it takes, takes to the level of what uh, court cases such as Brown v. Board of Education did, um, which were utilizing the court to challenge the constitutionality of an issue. So that's the purpose. Continuing on with civil disobedience. I thought that this was a great quote. So if, you, if you're not like me and you're not on a, a larger level and you just want to put at ease to your own conscience, this is a quote, to put an end to someone's personal complicity in the injustice which flows from obedience to unjust law. Michael Eric Dyson, raise your hand. Know him? Okay. Carol Anthony doesn't count. <laughs> Besides Carol Anthony, anyone know Michael Eric Dyson? Okay, not so much. Okay. Uh, phenomenal guy. Um, he, we have some similarities uh, in terms of what we do, in terms of public discourse, in terms of informing people, in terms of having goals and objectives and uh, that play along the lines of morality and ethics. So he says, and so my own truth telling, as far as I'm able to muster the courage to say what needs to be said, and that thing was on a continuum because all of us are made cowards by the realization that ultimately we have never said everything that we're supposed to say. It's that old saying uh, that when they came from my neighbor, something like that, I didn't speak up. And they came from my mother, I didn't speak up. But when they came for me, what? There was nobody to speak up. There was no one to speak up. Thank you, Carol Anthony. Okay. Michael Eric Dyson was also a professor until recently uh, at University of Pennsylvania. So I'm glad that I had the opportunity to do this presentation because I, I had always uh, modeled my actions somewhat after Dr. King, somewhat at least after the civil rights movement, and I really uh, modeled it after uh, this quote, one has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to a disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine. Now we've got to have a hand raise, right? St. Augustine. Any St. Augustine takers? Okay, I got some nods in the front. St. Augustine on that an unjust law is no law at all. Uh, to put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, got another head nod. An unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal and natural law. And the law stuff, you know, you'll get into if you're a poli sci law, etc. But everyone here at Villanova has a special place in their heart for uh, Aquinas and Augustine. And so um, it's great to see that they have a day for Dr. King because Dr. King is actually modeling some of his philosophies after Augustinian philosophies as well. So I have the technical definitions of what it means to obey the law. Um, so following the commands or guidance of, that is obeying. But what is enforcing? Okay, so since we already have technically just laws, we only have that one law in Delaware, and we're obeying that law. Is that good enough? I argue no. Why do I argue no? Because it's not enough just to have the law on the books if they're not enforcing it. So that's why I came up with this concept midpoint of my presentation about obeying versus enforcing the law. Be peaceful, be courteous, obey the law, respect everyone, but if someone puts his hand on you, send him to the cemetery, any takers on who that quote belongs to, and I'll give you a clue, it would be civil rights movement versus modern. Anyone? That would be what is maybe perceived as arch nemesis to Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. So two somewhat different philosophies. I argue um, always in my work that Malcolm X wasn't necessarily his nemesis, but that Malcolm X had to portray himself in a somewhat radical or militant manner so that Dr. King's policies would be more widely accepted. Because we can't just jump from point A to point B. There has to be a period of gradual inclination and opening your minds up to what we see today and what we saw yesterday on the mall in Washington, D.C., which was an African-American president. So then we have the definition uh, to enforce. So to put and keep in force, compel obedience to, which is an uh, interesting uh, definition. So keep that in the back of your mind about the difference between, come on in, the difference between obeying law and enforcing law. 
talks about some types of unjust laws. Uh, no duty to obey unless disobedience would cause scandal or disturbance, i.e. a greater evil. Uh, this is an example. Take of it what you will. According to morality, war would not be a good. Our taxes pay for a war. However, we are required to pay for taxes. So if that's something not good, it's somewhat contradictory in terms. However, if all of us stop paying taxes, what would occur? Potentially, one could argue a greater evil could occur, being that our taxes are not only utilized for a single source. So it's a little bit of a stretch, but it gives you somewhat of a relevant idea of what we are speaking. And I like to show pictures whenever I can of Malcolm X and, and Dr. King standing together and instead of being posed as what they are typically throughout history in an adversarial role. Uh, continuing on, these terms probably look familiar to you, um, especially in your early years here at Villanova. Laws contrary to the divine good. Uh, this example was given um, by a uh, Catholic website, so I thought it would be apropos if I was giving a slightly uh, more liberal answer. It was a quote that said, this would compel you to violate divine law, i.e. the case of uh, an abortion. Uh, a doctor would basically rather die than have to perform this. And again, this is a quote from uh, the Catholic website that I visited as an example. When I came across um, this concept of obeying versus enforcing the law, I came across this great case, uh, State of Ohio versus Quigley. Uh, and it happened to actually be a reverend who was challenging um, some school issues that they had. And it specifically got into the difference between obeying and enforcing law. To enforce the law is something more than different to obey the law. To enforce the law is exercise of a power or authority. It's limited to the following executive, police, or administrative acts. The duty is general upon all to obey the law, but there's no such duty upon those to enforce the law. So obviously we're getting into opinion, which would be correct because this is a part of an opinion written by a justice on the case. So it's open to interpretation, so keep that in mind. What do we as common individuals, common ordinary mind, understand about the common ordinary words to enforce the law? Is it merely to obey the law ourselves? Or is it to constrain, and pardon me, others to obey the law as well? He concludes, there is in actuality a vast difference between the two. One is a common duty that all of us have, and the other is a duty imposed upon a few. Pardon me, the few being those in the lawmaking or elected official capacity that have the ability to rule on these, these types of issues. Uh, this quote, the gleeful notes of civilization succeeded in the war groups of savages, that was also an addendum to what we were previously, previously, pardon me, discussing in Ohio versus Quigley. So that threw me off a little bit, um, especially because when I am discussing uh, Native Americans, I'm always keying in on the word savages. Um, so we have this person who is obviously an intellectual, talking about uh, the deeper elements of theory and philosophy and law and politics, and yet this is their comment. Uh, we'll get into, actually I won't get into, but Professor Eckstein will get into the mascot issue, okay? So we have up here the fighting Jews, Chicago Blacks, uh, the Latinos, the Orientals, the Caucasians, and the Redskins. So we're going to get into my argument, the underlying reason why I view these laws, while technically on the books, are merely a politically correct measure, okay, echoing federal law, so they're in compliance, but they're not actually enforcing them. And my argument about why they're not enforcing them is going to follow. This is a picture, very quickly, uh, of Native Americans, Sac, Fox, Pitts, Tomey, uh, in 1858, a delegation uh, about constitutional reform. So in addition to uh, participating in a delegation on constitutional reform, the Constitution itself was modeled after several elements of Native American law. George Washington. So now we started off here with the mascot issue and we're going back to the heart of it, okay? If you can follow that. In the meantime, it will be a desirable thing for the protection of the union to cooperate as far as circumstances may conveniently admit with the disinterested endeavors of your society to civilize and Christianize the savages of the wilderness. So that is the founder of our country, okay? The whole point of America is entwined with this notion of the fact that indigenous nations, indigenous people are not in fact equals 
They are not, in fact, intellectuals. They are not, in fact, in me, capable of engaging political discourse. They are savages, and it terms them as that. Uh, another quote. What good man would prefer a country covered with forests and ranged by a few thousand savages to our extensive republic studded with cities and towns and prosperous farms, embellished with all the improvements which can devise or industry execute? So when I listen to my Christian radio station every morning, every once in a while, they talk about these great founding fathers, Andrew Jackson, George Washington, okay? They conveniently leave out other parts of history. Specifically, how did these individuals view my ancestors? I think the words speak for themselves. Moving on to the mascot issue. How's this? You teach us to irrigate and plant corn? We'll decimate your tribe and name a baseball team after you. So, so where does that come from, that lack of respect, that lack of uh, understanding and assigning human value? Well, if we have it here at the lower levels with the foundation of our country, I argue that it's so deeply entwined and embedded in the fabric of who we are as quote unquote Americans, how can we have any different attitude in response to that in today's modern times than have and utilize these images without seeing that there are any issues with that? This, by the way, is on uh, National Council on Racism in the Media, which is formed by the American Indian Movement from the 70s. That theory goes on, to, and we'll just dabble in this. Uh, what I term, again, I like to term things and kind of theorize um, in, in the work that I do, prepackaged identities. So what are the identities you have as an indigenous person? Before you met me today, no one knew an indigenous rights activist. Okay, so I'm sure possibly you've met Native Americans, okay, but this is what you have to look at because we're not in mainstream media. And the images that you have conform to a certain stereotype, such as what we see here. Land O'Lakes, actually, um, I utilize a lot. That was a picture they had in 1921. So 1921, and that other picture was from 2008, from, or pardon me, 2008 to 2009, their website currently, right now, today, what has changed in their depiction of Native Americans. Now that might not be generally offensive, but we need as intellectuals, as Villanovans, to take a step beyond our realm of consciousness that we previously had, okay, before we entered these walls here at Villanova, and say, now wait a minute, why is, this, why is there this term of, of collective ownership? Again, me and my quotes and theories. Collective ownership, why do we own, is there any other person, people, nation out there that we own, that we feel we can take the images and likenesses of and own as ourselves, okay? Very quickly, this is a broadcast that would occur and play along simultaneously with the national anthem, the United States of America national anthem throughout all of the time since television occurred, black and white to color TV, alongside would be the, in the top part, you can see in the top part of that screen, would be a Native American head, also, when that screen would dissipate, it would be a Native American head as a whole. So it's literally entwined into the fabric of our nation. It goes through to modernity and is exasperated by pop culture. Coming down to the end here. So what are my barriers to true progression? Are the, are the barriers, uh, the people that are out there using the N-word you know, with our new president, Obama, are the barriers, um, the people that really don't think that you know, those Indians need to be saved when I go and talk to them, they say, oh, that's the old Indian burial ground out there. Are those my true barriers? I argue no. I argue that my true barriers are the persons that on the outside might nod or silently agree with, but really aren't doing anything, um, that are conforming to a moderate appeal, and I, even would argue, even consider themselves possibly liberal, that they would be open to these types of things, but really in actuality, at the end of the day, they're not moving forward on these issues once I or anyone else has brought them to attention. So Dr. King has a quote, letter uh, from a Birmingham jail. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's greatest stumbling block on the stride toward freedom is not the citizen's counselor or the KKK, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you, you know, in the goal that you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically 
believes he can set the timetable for someone else's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time. So hopefully, this has been, you know, a hodgepodge uh, presentation today, as, you know, kind of has to happen in the time frame that we have. We had a lot, we had a lot to cover and dissect today, and hopefully I've been able to provide you with uh, an overview of the work that I do, not just in actuality with the pictures and the burial grounds, and you see what I'm doing, and you see where the remains are, and I'm trying to get them back through the process of rep repatriation, pardon me, in NAGPRA, um, but the underlying theories and concepts and philosophies that guide the work that I do, and how that came from Villanova through St. Augustine, through an Augustinian view, okay, came through Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement, and landed pretty much, and we'll see what happens, but on the doorstep, again, of the White House with President Obama taking office yesterday. And I hope that this type of barrier, one that agrees in theory, uh, will actually be a barrier that won't occur. They will agree in actuality. He will uh, bring his promises to fruition and uh, actually take methods of direct action. Some images I'm concluding with are of Dr. King that you might not normally see. I'm correlating some of these images with Dr. King to show in Native America how people are doing the same types of actions that they did in the civil rights movement. They might not attain the same media outlet and cry as Native Americans have historically followed the black or African American movement, but they're still there nevertheless. In between the correlation, uh, these are a couple of pictures that I took at Dr. King's Museum located in Atlanta, Georgia, a uh, sign that struck me immediately as I walked in the door, for white only. And I thought, wow, I have never seen a sign like that in my lifetime unless it's been in this museum uh, uh, setting. What followed it was great about segregation and self-reliance. It mentioned, for instance, questions, if, it, if I was living in a segregated world, where could I buy a book? Where could I purchase groceries, et cetera? And they had great information there. I segue that into the Native American Museum, which is located in Washington, D.C. You should see it. It's phenomenal. Uh, take a trip there. I definitely recommend it. Um, as I mentioned before, since my father is Nanticoke and I'm Nanticoke, these are some pictures of uh, the Nanticoke display that is down there. Eventually, I hope to have a Nanticoke display that deals with some of the work that I'm doing with the burial ground protection that you can go and view, and that process is in the works. That was a picture of me handing it up for the camera. Um, contrary to popular belief, uh, Native Americans uh, Native American rights activists, pardon me, we don't really rank on the Fortune 500 list. I know, whoa, I know, I know, it's a shock, it's a shock. So that was me changing uh, in the bathroom. Couldn't really afford to stay in the hotel, but I could have enough gas you know, to get there, to, to mingle, to talk to people. Um, and I met Ryan uh, Redhand, who is now going to be my graphic designer for Indigenous Power. Amazing individual. Uh, he actually designed shirts such as the um, Columbus shirt, anti-Columbus shirt that I'm wearing today. That's him uh, in the right corner. I'm sorry, it's a little bit fuzzy. Um, this is Russell Means, huge, huge Native American rights activist, uh, and obviously using methods, or pardon me, methods of direct action. He is wearing a t-shirt that is vandalism, Mount Rushmore, and vandalism, obviously say, say, utilizing the fact and saying that Mount Rushmore carved with those people uh, along the lines of the Andrew Jacksons and the George Washington into the earth is actually an act of vandalism. When this powwow occurred at University of Minnesota, the University of Minnesota Native American Student Association, uh, near and dear to my heart, because when I was here at Villanova in 2000, I started the Native American Student Association. And they went and they roped off 1,720 seats in remembrance of the University of Minnesota collectively owning the human remains that they had discovered and not being repatriated back to their individual nations. So there are people out there that are doing um, that are utilizing, pardon me, rather, methods of direct action to attain their goals.
are now President Obama uh, speaking to the uh, Crow Nation where he was named. Uh, Crows are historically fairly conservative people. Winona Duke talked about on the video that I couldn't show earlier uh, about how significant it was the fact that they embraced now President uh, Obama and, and named him in a naming ceremony. So what are we saying here uh, in, in conclusion? Uh, what would Dr. King want me to do in my work? And what would Dr. King want you to do in terms of my work or in terms of your own moral compass? Ensure that our voices must be heard. Ensure that my voice must be heard. Any ideas? Do the right things by God, Is she on it or what? I mean, this woman. Gosh, and my dad's amazed back there because he's like, I had, I wouldn't have got that in probably in 5,000 years. Okay, do the right thing. That's, that's all I can say in conclusion, that I would think that Dr. King would want me to do and what, you would, what he would want you to do, whether it's this issue or any other issues that you have. You went to Villanova, you had that Augustinian blood flowing through you, you have that flowing through, flowing through you, pardon me, through today with Dr. King's celebration, which by the way, wasn't here when I was at school. Okay, this is a... A fairly new concept, you know, we're here 99 to 2003, okay, so they've done a lot of work just to get it to where we are today. I sat on a committee where we had uh, professors and chairs, it was a Villanova University or Inclusiveness and Diversity Committee. I said, I'm not leaving the room until we do work on celebrating issues with Dr. King. Me and Christine Gertow, uh, the SGA uh, president, and that was in 2002, um, we had threatened to take our reading days away. Do you still have reading days? Okay, so they um, lessened our reading days, at least for that year upcoming, instead of taking out all of the breaks that we have, summer and winter, et cetera. But we said, no, it's the right thing to do, to celebrate the accomplishments of Dr. King, especially because we're here at Villanova, especially because we're reflecting the Augustinian view and our morals. So um, with that, I want to thank you and uh, take any questions, because I know it's about time to get out of here. Okay. Any one of you know the four of you? <laughs> Any questions today? What year are you? I'm a junior. You're junior. Okay, so you've been around the block. Freshman. Freshman. Aw. Every day. Aw. And gentleman in the back. Sophomore. Sophomore. Senior. Senior. You acted like it when you when you came in here. I was gonna say. Um, so. Hopefully you can take um, any information I had today's presentation. There's going to be a couple more Native American topics, plugging Dr. Wall really quickly, I think, at 1030. Uh, the mascot issue is definitely going to be interesting uh, with Professor Eckstein. Eckstein? Eckstein? Okay. Um, and I think it's back in here at the cinema at 130. I'm not 100% I'm not sure. I have to look on the paper. Is that what it is? Yes. Cinema, or 1130. Let's see. Yeah, Rick's at 130. Works at 1.30. Okay, so if you can sneak back in here, I think it would be a pretty cool thing to see. Um, there's probably going to be, because he's a professor, so he has a little bit more pool. I'm traveling from, you know, Delaware and haven't been here uh, in a few years. Haven't been a student anyway in a few years. I've been back. And uh, so he probably has some pool with some of the kids in his class. And it'll be great, especially for you. Don't want to single you out. Uh, but to see, um, when I was here last year, I mean, this place, were you here, Carol? It, it was pretty packed. Um, there are a pretty decent amount of your uh, fellow classmates that were in here uh, participating in his discussion on the mascot issue. So hopefully if you come to that today with my background information, you might have a more holistic perspective. Okay? So see you. Have a great day. Thanks for coming.